so given this state space model, design a controller with 15% overshoot and a settling time of one second. So it's what is the order of this system? Third order. And how many inputs? One. How do we know that? Yeah, the B matrix is is n by one. Uh, and how many outputs? One, because the C and the D matrices have just one row. So single input, single output, third order system. And we're going to design a controller for 15% overshoot and a settling time of one second. So that's essentially telling us where to put the poles, right? Where to put the closed loop poles. Um, it doesn't actually specify all of them. What it specifies is it specifies where the two dominant poles should be. And then the other one we could put wherever, uh, as long as it doesn't mess up the, the uh, dominance of the other two poles. So, all right. Uh, we're going to do this almost exclusively in MATLAB. Do you guys want this file? For those of you who are like, got your laptops out? Yeah, I'll just send it to you then. All right. So the first thing to do, of course is to define our original state model A, B, C, D as I have done here and <clears throat> we'll use the uh, uh, state space SS command to form a, a state model of it and uh, a transfer function um, open loop of course we could also find um, using the TF command as well so that is our uh, state, state space model and our transfer function. Okay. Um, the first step is to specify the desired closed loop pole location. So that is the. Are we like. It's like an airline thing to you guys? That's a slack line. Yeah, you can take Oh. Uh, I was like. <laughs> You've, you've arrived at your destination. Uh, okay, cool. So, percent overshoot, 15. Settling time, one second. Um, the way that I went about solving for where the closed loop poles are is I said, oh, okay. Um, here's my zeta that's required based on the percent overshoot. Here's the omega n required based off of the settling time, and uh, which is also related to zeta. And then I stuck my uh, poles at those locations, so omega, zeta, etc. And then I stuck the other one out arbitrarily at minus 20. And if I evaluate that, it will give me a uh, it gives me CL poles desired um, gives me negative 20 plus or minus uh, well I guess I guess negative 20 is the is the real one I stuck out there and then negative four plus or minus six point six 
J. So pretty, uh, pretty much a uh, second order approximation is pretty good there because we stuck our other pole out at negative 20. So we didn't, didn't screw with it too much. So it should be pretty good. If we wanted to, we could stick it out anywhere we want. Minus 200 if we wanted to. But minus 20 seems more reasonable. Uh, so we'll do that. Uh, and then the, the closed loop uh, transfer function is going to be, um, th this is the design closed loop transfer function. This is what we're aiming for, is that we have um, no zeros, which we didn't start with any zeros, our transfer function, oh, we did, we started with one zero. Oh, so we stuck our one zero back in. We said, oh, keep the original zero, and our closed loop poles desired is uh, what it'll actually be. That's our design. Um, so that was our that's our design system that we're aiming for. But we don't know what the gains need to be to make that happen yet. So that's what we're starting with. Now we're gonna we're gonna create our our controller canonical form, okay? Which the A matrix is going to uh, be pretty easy, right? Zeros and ones for the first two rows. And then we've got to populate this last row, but how do we do that? Do you guys, you guys remember how? Characteristic polynomial, right? So, um, yeah, so there are several ways to do it, but um, you can, uh, let's see, how did I do it, um, how did I do it so easily there? I'm trying to think of as like an easy way to do it. Oh, there's the easy way. The easy way was to was to print out the was to print out the open loop transfer function, because remember that the um, remember that the the uh, denominator of the closed loop transfer function is the characteristic polynomial. And so that's invariant to changes in basis, and that's where these, this bottom row of our, of our canonical form comes from. So that's how I should, could just sit here and say, oh, it's just uh, negative 2, negative 3, negative 3 is to pl pluck it from there. Otherwise, you can go through, you can use the eigenvalues if you want to and find them. It's pretty, uh, there are like 15 ways you could do it. I think that this is the easiest way, though. In MATLAB, at least, this is the easiest way because it's easy to get this transfer function to print out for you. So that's nice. You can automate it, too. But I was, I was not going for what is, the, what is the best way to program this. I was going for what is the way that, I guess, is, makes most sense for how we learn how to do this. Um, I will give away the fact that most of this can can be done simply by using the acker function. If you have the control systems toolbox, uh, uh, it's it's this. It'll give you the gains, which is pretty sweet. All you give it is the A matrix, the B matrix, and then the the closed loop pole location you want. Isn't that just bitching? I think it's bitching. So, yeah, if you yeah, if you have it, it should show up in the help. But if you have the control systems toolbox, it should be there. Is that a separate 
Uh, it's a it's a toolbox, so you have to like you have to pay extra for it. It's, but I think the student version comes with it. Yeah. 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 It's it's one of the like it's one of the important ones. There's I wonder, Sirak, do you know if, if uh, do you have the the Python toolbox installed right now? Yeah, but through my laptop. I've never tried Actor, but I don't know what that is. I'm curious. Yeah. Anyways, you can always do it this way. Yeah. So, we're going to roll our own. Um, and we're going to make our, our, uh, our controllability matrix. So, we're going to need that. For it. So a, our B matrix is just zeros all the way to the last one. It's one. This is always how the B matrix looks. Um, then we have to find what our, our TC is going to be. So we have to find our two controllability matrices, right? And we're just plugging right into the formula for it. So plug in the B, A, B, A squared, B. And then the same for the canonical thing. Um, you can use the, there is another function called uh, CTRB, controllability matrix, um, and so you could use that too. I'm just expressing it explicitly here. Um, and I think since I didn't use, I didn't define um, a C and a D matrix for uh, uh, this system. So the the CTRB requires that you give it like a full system. I think as I require. I don't remember. I have to look back. But in any case, you c you can use the CTRB to get controllability matrix. In some cases, in any case, you could always just type it out like this as well. Another possibility. Uh, and then TC as we said, is just equal to uc times u inverse. So I printed out what uc is, I printed out what tc is, and look, they're even really nice ones and twos. That's pretty nice, and zeros, yeah. It actually does have, I looked at the documentation. Nice. It has full placement u and hacker Yeah. So, yeah. Acker method is what we learn, and they're uh, automating all of this into one path, which makes sense. It's great, but also it takes away the fun too. So we don't want to do that. We want to give you guys the opportunity to do it yourself. Okay. So uh, the. The uh, KP, so this is to go back to our, let's go back to our uh, notes for a second. Our, our K prime can be computed um, so from down here. This is, our, this is what our K prime is. We want to compute k prime, and then we're going to compute k from the k prime. So we got to compute k prime first, uh, and that is the denominator of this function. So it's easiest to just print it out and read it off. So you can actually extract. I wasn't writing this to be to be uh, like efficient or anything, because it requires that you plug things in. But notice that once again, I'm reading off of the now it's the closed loop, um, uh, the design closed loop denominator. I can read off what our design case should be. So this is what we, we're, we're wanting them to be, the deltas. Um, this is what, this is, uh, um, 1196, 1196 to 16.9, 16.9. Uh, oh, I actually miss, 
is 2.9, 2.19.9. Uh, and 28. Um, it's all right. I like. I'm gonna make sure I'm not telling you some some crap here. Oh yeah, no, I shouldn't be editing this. It, well, it's close. Um, what I'm doing is I've got my A's. Here, where did I? Um, I've got my my A C matrix, and uh, I'm taking these values, so I'm computing is this formula here. I'm computing k prime. So you need to take the, the desired ones and subtract out what these a values are from the bottom row. Um, and so the this is the desired closed loop one. So this is my d, 1198, this is the first one. And then I need to subtract out uh, 3, right? So for I subtract it out, no, I subtract out 2. That's the one I'm supposed to subtract out. 1198 minus 2 is 1196. And then I take the next one, which is 219.9. And then I subtract out 3. And then I take... Uh, 28, which is the next one, and I subtract out 3 to get 25. So that's that's what we did. We could have done this automated, and I guess I thought it would be easier to explain it in like by plugging it in in numbers, but it's not. It's actually just more confusing. Uh, but do you see what we did? We, we were using this formula 9.13 to say that our desired closed loop polynomial, our, our design closed loop polynomial uh, coefficients, you need to subtract the, the uh, values from the A matrix and you get the you get the uh, uh, the primed k values, so that's what we did. And apologies for that not being very super obvious. Uh, and then uh, k then. Well, I subtract two. Um, I it's uh, yeah, it's negative negative two. So the the. The two, uh, so the A's don't include the negative signs in them, in the definition of the A. Okay. So then it's a negative negative, which, yeah, it's unnecessarily confusing, perhaps. But in any case, uh, that's, the, that's the formula. And you can, you can automate this by taking the... the uh, the closed loop system. So the system closed loop. You could subtract. You could you could extract out the coefficients of the polynomial. It's not super easy to do in Nala, but you can do it. Uh, and you can then take that and and automate this process of sub of subtraction, which is. The way it should be coded in here, but I tried. To, I was like trying to make it more intuitive, and instead made it more confusing. So that is uh, that is that. And then I just need to use this last formula here to convert 
from k prime, which is what we have, to k, which is what we want. So we have to go through tc, right? So tc, and that gives us k, which is this array here. So 25, 107, negative 117, and 1,004. Those are our gains. Now our closed loop system we can define because we know what our k is. So a closed loop, b closed loop, c closed loop. This is just hearkening back to these formulas, right? And now I can do the closed loop state space model and the transfer function. I could take that from the state space. If I want to uh, get a zero steady state error, then that's easy enough to do as well for a step input. Um, I just need to evaluate the closed loop transfer function at um, uh, zero frequency and make that the inverse of that my n and that is uh, yeah that's pretty much my it's pretty much my my uh, all of the things that I needed now I could do the simulation so I simulate it for two seconds I do a step response of the closed loop system I'm multiplying this by n because I am I am scaling um, the input, the, the, the step input is uh, the command, right? I'm scaling that by n, and so I could equivalently ste uh, uh, step the uh, output by n as well. So I could do the input by n. I want to use the step uh, function, though. So if you want to use the step function, you have to scale whatever your output is by n. This is just, we're just using um, uh, uh, what is that? It's not linearity. What's that property called? Superposition. Yeah. Superposition. Because uh, we scale the, the input by n, we could scale the output by n. And that's what we did here. And we're just going to plot it. And we'll look at the step info. So let's do that. Uh, oh. Did. Oh, so yeah, comment that out. So that is all to do with. I'm, I'm printing this out to TIKZ for my notes. Uh, and I'm going to give you guys this part, this, this example filled in. Uh, I don't think I did give it to you filled in, did I? I? I meant to give it to you filled in. Because this is an example, it's mostly in MATLAB, and if it's mostly in MATLAB, it's hard to take notes on it. So I try to give you guys the fill-in that has all of the notes filled in, because then you'll see it. Looking back, give some, give you something to reference. So this is, uh, and this is what we want, right? So first off, um, I, I printed out step info as well, so I did step info, and I got, um, what was my design here? I wanted a, uh, yeah, so 15%, I got 13.67, um, and I got uh, was the other the other requirement was settling time of one second, so settling time of about one second. So I mean the the parameters were still based on the, the second order approximation, which wasn't perfect, right? So that's why it's not exact. Yeah. So once you get to this point, what are your first a good question. Um, you can you can tweak. The, 
the way I would the way I would tweak this is actually I wouldn't tweak the gains directly. You can you can tweak the gains directly, but instead of tweaking the gains, um, it usually is a little bit more intuitive to tweak the pull placement instead. So you can automate this whole thing so you don't have to like look at in the command window and see what the denominator of the transfer function is and plug it back in. So you can do this loop pretty rapidly. So you can move your pull, your your um, closed loop pull desired locations from um, these ones here. Instead of putting them there based on a 15% overshoot at a certain side length time, say it was, see, we, we like essentially hit our target right on, but we were a little bit off on overshoot, a little bit off on settling time. If we wanted to tweak it in any given direction, the way I tweak this would be to actually go back to percent overshoot tweaking because it computes the pull location based on that. I would go back to this. Another thing you could do is start tweaking like where you put these manual ones. Because one of the things that's tough about pull placement is you don't really know where to put all of the poles that you don't care about. The dominant ones are the ones you care about. You want to put the other ones out there somewhere. You can move them further out. Um, it's the only issue with moving things further and further out. Like you can move, put them out at negative five million. Uh, usually, you're going to instantiate these things in well, if it's if it's instantiating it in a uh, an analog circuit, then you got to have components that are going to work. So that could be sizing those components could be hard if you move one way out there. And then if you're going to use a digital circuit, then lots of times you have run into floating point number problems um, because one number will be really small, one number will be really big, and then it's hard to uh, keep them both um, accurately enough because you start losing digits of precision. But yeah, so you can start tweaking these. I, I mean, usually you would go back and move the poles around. So I mean, tweaking percent overshoot and settling time requirement uh, tweaks the the uh, closed loop pull locations. You could do that directly though. You could say, I want to move my closed loop pulls like like you could put like minus five here or something like that. And that would move them to the left five and it would make the settling time shorter probably. So the next question would be, um, mm -hmm. how do you extract Mm. So, stability is governed by the location of the closed loop poles. And as long as you choose them all to be in the left half plane, you're good. It, you know, if, uh, if you choose them, and they will be essentially right on. So, just because our, our settling time and percent overshoot, uh, are they're just approximations so we 15 and 1 didn't come out to be exactly 15 and 1 uh, but the pole locations so if we looked at our, our closed loop pole uh, so this is our transfer function I think I can uh, no but if I do this Um, if I do sys clzpk dot poles, and then it's a cell, so I I love, but this this hate MATLAB at the same time. So these are the actual closed loop poles we ended up with, which is like exactly what we I mean within precision of the numbers is exactly what we said. I mean, we solved them to be exactly there. And so we we can be pretty precise with that. Like if we have one that's on the border of being stable or not, we don't really have to worry that much because it's going to be it's going to be stable because we will be right there on it. I mean, at least mathematically. 
I mean, because it's not like, like the open list system, you could have them all on the left hand plane, but there's a certain game play that's going to be stable. But now we're actually defining the closed loop pole. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're sticking the closed loop poles in the location. So it's not just depending on gain. Like we spec we specified the gains and these is where they are. So yeah, it's it's nice. I mean it's like it's kind of like everything we dreamed of doing back in, you know, when we were doing our lead controllers or lag controllers. We're like, well, we would really like to put our dominant poles here and then our other poles way out here. We we can just do that with pole placement. Which is cool. Um, yeah, so you can always make it stable because you can specify all left half plane closed loop poles. And there's nothing to really, I mean, there's nothing to tweak directly. I mean, you could tweak these gains directly. You know, those gains, you could move them up and down directly, but it's hard to have any intuition as, as to what they're going to do for you. Um, when it's state feedback, there's a little bit more intuition involved, but it's still not great. And once you get away from state feedback, it's uh, almost all intuition goes away, at least for me. So I, I would usually go back and just move closed loop pole locations around. Um, yeah, your zeros stay in the same places. So sometimes that can still cause issues. So like if you have zeros, we haven't talked a lot about this, but if you have zeros in the right half plane, for instance, um, that is a that is a boatload of fun. Um, they're called non-minimum phase systems, and they have, for instance, they'll have step responses that uh, when you know, you're used to a step response responding to go up to it. When it does step response, it'll go down and then it'll come back up. Like it'll do all kinds of weird stuff with those non minimum phase systems. So we can't get rid of those in in this sort of a uh, system, but those are uh, this sort of controller design. Those are rare, actually. Those non minimum phase systems are, are rare systems. And the folks who. Uh, Deal with non-minimum phase systems. It's like a, it's a, it's an entire research area, um, and they are uh, feed-forward control folks. Those, that's like their, that's where feed-forward control really shines is non-minimum phase systems. So, yeah. So you usually say this to higher order systems. Is it still applicable to? Lower order systems or yeah, okay. sure. I mean, this was third order, but you could do second order. You could do first order. You could do fiftieth order. Would be fine. And it's it, it is a little bit. I do I do want to caution you too, because I mean, what this says is, oh yeah, we can just specify where we want the closed loop pole to be, and so why would you ever do any other type of control or like you know it's so easy like the control problem is solved. Like, let's just go home now. Like, we can just have the script do it. Um, but a lot of issues arise when you start looking at realities like, what is control effort going to be? Um, 